Good morning. It's a little old school, but I'm coming to you without Skype. <laughs> um, is there a way that we can not display the, the uh, website just yet? That would be great. Um, so I am going to talk to you about uh, the world outside the clinic. Um, how, how many of you uh, would describe yourselves, just a show of hands, as either working in healthcare or healthcare policy? So a fairly, fairly large proportion. I'm, I'm a family physician, um, so I come from that world. Um, and uh, much of the energy that we put into improving the delivery of care to our patients is, uh, is critical. And the discussion we just had about the need to improve access to care and overcome uh, barriers to insurance and affordability is vital. But one of the things I've been uh, uh, interested in my career is, is that uh, our heavy investment in healthcare in the United States doesn't seem to be working very well. I just had the opportunity recently to, I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong with my remote control. Maybe I don't have it turned on. Ah, there it is. It's moving over there, but not on here. Okay. Um, I had the opportunity to chair a panel uh, that was co-sponsored by the National Research Council and the Institute of Medicine comparing the health of the United States to other high-income countries. And uh, you can Google it. It's called Shorter Lives, Poorer Health. Uh, runs about 400 pages in length and documents a very serious problem that despite us spending way more on health care than any other country in the world, um, is a percentage of our GDP and just in total dollars, uh, we have worse health than those countries on many measures. Uh, shown here are mortality rates. If you look over at the chart on the right-hand side, you see life expectancy. The U.S. ranks lowest in life expectancy for males, second lowest for females. Mortality rates on the left-hand side are higher in the United States than in those other countries. And I would, uh, if you can focus or read the lettering there, you'll see that some of those causes of death are things that have nothing to do with health care. Um, our report documented a pervasive problem across all age groups for diseases uh, and injuries and a variety of conditions that clearly indicate that the reasons for our health disadvantage go beyond our problems with health care. So I've learned in my career that we have to learn, be, look beyond the clinic to try to understand uh, how we're going to really improve health outcomes. Um, this here is a diagram. Again, the intent here is not for you to actually read this because the font is really small. This is the World Health Organization's model uh, describing all the things that affect our health. So over on the far right hand, oops, trying to get the pointer to work here. Oops. What did I do? Okay. I'm going to give up on the pointer. The, the box in the very lower right-hand corner, uh, I can see it, thank you, Pat, uh, is health care. Um, the rest of the boxes on the diagram are all the many other things that shape our health. Um, and I simply point, to, I usually show this to medical students and residents and my colleagues in clinical medicine to give us a little humility about how much we can actually impact in, in doctor's offices and hospitals, that uh, health is very much shaped by factors outside the clinic and our costs for health care that are the concern of government and employers are shaped by those factors outside of health care. So from a policy perspective, focusing our energies on health care delivery and health care payment is, is vitally important but misses the full picture if we don't recognize the importance of the policies on those other boxes that uh, not only shape health outcomes but potentially shape it more than health care does. Uh, it's well known that most of the chronic diseases that drive health care costs and that are bringing patients into the emergency room and our hospitals and nursing homes are caused by unhealthy behaviors. But those, in turn, uh, are not entirely just matters of personal choice or personal responsibility. They have very much to do with the environment in which we live. This is a, a model developed by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation showing that health is shaped very much by personal behaviors, and yes, health care but both of those are shaped by environmental factors that uh, are in our daily lives that influence uh, our ability to live healthy lives and also our ability to access health care. 
Um, there are what you might call downstream determinants of health that shape our access to healthy foods, our ability to maintain physical activity, to live in safe neighborhoods, to uh, breathe clean air, um, to avoid uh, injuries from crime and so forth. But the, there are even more important upstream determinants such as education, income, and economic growth that are very important drivers of health. In our world uh, in, the, uh, in which policy is shaped, these tend to be handled by different committees and different jurisdictions. Uh, this is issues around education reform, jobs, the economy. Many people think, well, that's not healthcare policy. But if you take a more holistic view, you'll realize that these policies are actually health policies and have not only huge implications on health outcomes, but costs of health care. Uh, we've done research at my institution, Virginia Commonwealth University, trying to put this in perspective for policymakers. Here, for an example, is an analysis of how many lives would be saved if everybody had the mortality rates of people who attend some college education, don't even graduate from high school. The bars in the back represent the number of lives that would be saved if you waved a magic wand and everybody had the mortality rate of college educated adults. The bars in the front is what we, are the number of lives we actually save by biomedical advances in this country. It's a ratio of seven to one. For every life we save from biomedical advances, we'd save seven uh, if everybody had the mortality rate of people with a college education. This is an analysis in Virginia of how many lives would be saved uh, if everybody in the state had the mortality rates of people who live in high income counties. 25% uh, of all deaths. There's no, I'm a doctor, and nothing I can do at the bedside or the hospital that can produce numbers like that. Uh, they're huge. Um, and this has led the field to recognize the so-called health in all policies notion that policies that we used to not think of as being relevant to health uh, are now being reconsidered in, in light of this. Land use decisions, transportation, zoning, a variety of other issues are now being approached by more enlightened uh, leaders uh, with a, 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 a perspective of how this will affect health and health care costs. Um, our elected officials and our CEOs at corporations around the United States are re really struggling with this issue of spiraling health care costs and how to bend the cost curve. And lots of ideas have been put on the table about potential reforms uh, on either side of the aisle as a way of trying to seize control, but no one really knows whether those will work and how much of an impact they will have. But it makes common sense to realize that one very effective way of controlling costs would be to cut off flow of disease into the system. Uh, if you have less patients entering the emergency room in the hospital and coming to the doctor's office because they're less sick, uh, you're obviously going to hugely affect uh, the spiraling cost of health care. And studies have actually borne this out. This is the paper by Bobby Milstein published, I think now, a year and a half ago. Um, where modeling was done. I won't take too much time to show you, but other than to say that there's only one curve on there where the, the cost curve actually starts dropping, where healthcare costs actually start going down. The other two are showing the effects of expanding access to healthcare, uh, like the reforms that Professor Nichols was just discussing. Uh, that, that will somewhat slow the rate of growth in healthcare costs. Um, uh, the second layer of uh, interventions in the second line is showing the effects of adding in improvements in delivery system efficiency, uh, so doing a better job in our healthcare delivery. But the third line, the one that actually caused the cost to drop down uh, and decline, is uh, actually dealing with the root causes in our social and environmental conditions. And it's only when we address those that we're actually going to see uh, the cost of care uh, diminish. Uh, this is an analysis our, our center recently did looking at uh, reauthorization of the Farm Bill that the Senate was considering. There was a House and a Senate proposal uh, last fall to cut funding for SNAP benefits to decrease food stamp eligibility. Um, again, a policy that you might think of has nothing to do with health care, and why is a physician up at the podium talking about uh, SNAP reauthorization? Well, it's because, uh, again, a policy like this that not only affects food choices, but affects poverty rates. Uh, because uh, low-income families that uh, are, have reduced food stamp eligibility must now shift more of their expenses 
um, and their household budget to, to food spending, uh, has a higher risk of being put into poverty, especially during difficult economic times. And what we showed, if you look at the, the, uh, the text box at the top there, it shows that the House bill was intended to save a certain amount of money. I can't read it from here, or you can probably better. But underneath that, in the table below it, is our analysis of what effect that reduction in food stamp eligibility would have on poverty rates. And we analyzed just, for example, the effect of those poverty rates on medical costs for diabetes care, one disease, and found that the increase in diabetes care costs would basically uh, offset whatever savings the, the House and Senate bills were proposing. So their so-called savings by cutting spending on food stamps was actually going to be lost completely by higher health care costs. So again, if we try to connect the dots and see the relationship between our public policies and health, uh, it might change our thinking about whether we're really benefiting, benefiting ourselves economically. Um, as already noted, uh, we live in a rather, rather affluent area, um, but if we look at it at the county level or the regional level, uh, it dilutes important uh, pockets of disadvantage that exist. Uh, this is uh, a recent analysis uh, that has been published. And the point of this is simply to say that um, we do have areas of, of where there are high uh, levels of social disadvantage. We've tried various ways in our work at our center to try to help policymakers, the public, the media understand the importance of these. And one that we developed was something called the county health calculator, which I'm going to try to demo for you uh, with a live connection in a second. Um, this, this is a, a calculator that you can visit by going to countyhealthcalculator.org uh, is the link, and it's probably there in your handout. Um, and just for illustration purposes, I'm going to pick Page County, which is a rural county. I'm, most of you are probably familiar with it. You go out I-66, you'll get there. Um, and what, the reason I want to select it is just as an example of a county that's struggling with very low levels of educational attainment. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and try now if we could switch over to the uh, computer. What I'm going to do uh, is show you how this calculator works. So this is the county health calculator, and if you um, visit the site, I've gone through a couple of initial steps just to get us up to this page, but if you visit this site, you can type in any state or county or the entire United States, if you will, and basically look at the effect of education and income on health, and on health outcomes, and as I'll point out in a minute, on costs. But for purposes of brevity here, because our time is limited, I've gone ahead and got this already two-page county just to show you the point here. So what this is saying here is that in Page County, 28% of adults have had some college education uh, compared to the best off location in the state, which is Falls Church City, where 86% have a college education. And here are the numbers on the percentage of the population uh, that is living in poverty. So let's say uh, you were trying to understand what would happen if we were to increase this education number from its current 28% to something that looked closer to what Falls Church has. And what I want you to pay attention to are these bars here. The number of deaths per year in Page County, the number of people with diabetes, and here, if you're concerned about costs, the cost for that one disease. All right, we're now moving our way up to Falls Church. And just keep your eye on the bar. So we're trying to figure out how to bend the cost curve. Any suggestions? And yet you're the, you're the governor of this state or any other, and you're looking at how you're going to balance the budget. Um, Medicaid costs are driving, are, 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 are killing the budget. You cut education. You cut education. Um, but that's a, that works for, for short-term uh, balancing the budget, but in the long run is, uh, is not actually going to be uh, fiscally uh, the best option. You'll be out of office by then, uh, but the health care costs are actually going to go up. Um, so this is just one example. We can uh, go off the Internet screen here. I encourage you to visit County Health Calculator and try it out for any location uh, you'd like, although I'll point out that it does it at the county level. So if you look at Fairfax County as a county, um, it's going to look great. Um, but if you think about it, we could do an analysis like this at the census tract level in these particular pockets where um, the uh, report identifies areas of disadvantage and make the very same argument in terms of uh, 
what kind of ROI we'd be getting by addressing these. So my closing point is, let's not forget about factors outside the clinic, uh, which may be a, a very important factor in improving our health outcomes. Thank you very much.